Hi, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming along. Uh, it really is appreciated. So you might have seen recently in the news that Auckland has two main rail projects in store for our future. The first of these is the City Rail Link. As you can see, the grey lines indicate our existing train routes, and the coloured line indicates the City Rail Link. When that's opened and finished at the end of 2024, people in Auckland will be able to take a train into the CBD and not be forced to get out and get out at Britomart. Instead, they can go through an underground railway loop and get out at either Altair Square or at K Road, meaning that Aucklanders will have better access to the city by train. The second of these projects, and this is just a proposal at this stage, is the Auckland Light Rail Scheme. What this would be is a modern tramway stretching all the way from Wynyard Quarter right down south to the Auckland Airport, meaning that if you fly into Auckland Airport, you'll just be able to take a tram right up north to the CBD. Yet a lot of people have said that despite the, the fact that these projects might be good ideas, they've come decades too late. They should have been built ages ago. And that if that had happened, then our present day congestion problems wouldn't be anywhere, anywhere near as bad. So what I wanted to do was investigate this, investigate the validity of these claims and look at the history. And the first thing that I found was across a 20 year period, beginning in the early 40s and ending in the late 50s, Auckland made two crucial decisions, both of which neglected rail and instead shifted funding towards road construction and rubber tired public transport vehicles. The first of these was when Auckland replaced its old iconic trams with trolley buses, as you can see in this image. And the second was when Auckland decided to scrap a long standing railway scheme and instead swapped it out for motorway construction. So I had two questions for my project. Firstly, why did Auckland neglect rail in both of these cases? And then secondly, did either of those decisions actually contribute to our present day congestion problems? So first of all, let me take you back to a time when Auckland had trams, but then ripped them all out in favor of trolley buses. So actually at the very end of the 19th century, Auckland had trams, but they were horse drawn. At the very beginning of the 20th century, as you can see in that photo, everything changed. The Auckland Electric Tramway Company opened Auckland's very first electric trams in 1902. And then from that point onwards, these trams were incredibly popular. They were sleek. They were fast-ish. They, uh, <laughs> they were fast-ish. Uh, and they were also uh, a lot, they were noiseless, and they were also a lot better um, better smelling in comparison to the horse-drawn trams that had existed previously. And so as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, patronage absolutely boomed over the following couple of decades. But maybe a better way to illustrate this popularity is to compare those stats to our present day statistics. So in the most recent financial year that wasn't impacted by COVID, 2018 to 2019, 100 million Aucklanders took all of our public transport services. Yet in 1926, 63 million passengers took the trams alone, and then our population was 90,000, about 5% of what it is currently. Yet all of this changed when World War II broke out, because upon that happening, the government started rationing fuel. And so people who got around using cars or motor buses had to switch to something else. And so they overwhelmingly switched to the electric trams. This meant that patronage, which already was booming, boomed to an even greater degree, and the Auckland Transport Board couldn't handle the additional passengers. And so what they started doing was repairing each of their trams when they broke down or had mechanical issues only temporarily and in a makeshift manner, meaning that by the end of the war, pretty much all of their tram cars had deteriorated significantly. They just had to be replaced. But the Auckland Transport Board didn't replace these tram cars with new ones, and they didn't replace the old tracks which were run down with new ones. Instead, they just ripped the entire system out and replaced it with a trolley bus system. The origin for the switch from trams to trolley buses comes from 1938. And that year, farmers started running a trolley bus system instead of the old motor bus system between Queen Street and Hobson Street. And the reason for that was because a lot of people shopped on Queen Street during the 30s. And farmers didn't have a shop on Queen Street, but they had one on Hobson Street, 
So this bus connected the two streets and encouraged people to shop with farmers. These trolley buses were really, really popular. They were free, of course, but they also had leather seats, whereas the trams that were offered had wooden benches. Likewise, these trolley buses were also really, really good at getting up hills, far better than trams were. And of course, Auckland had never seen anything like them. So they were new and futuristic. And the Auckland Transport Board noticed this. They commented in 1939 in their annual report that they would consider ripping out their entire tram system to, uh, in favor of trolley buses to satisfy popular demand. But what was a possibility at the end of the 30s became probability and then a certainty by the mid 40s. In, 40, in 1944, the decision was made. Trams were out, trolley buses were in. But why? The Gribble and Foster report from 1946 gives us some hints. Uh, what this was, was a report made by two higher ups in the Auckland Transport Board who went to America, England and Canada and investigated what cities in those countries were actually doing with their transport systems. And they drew three main conclusions. Firstly, especially in America, many mid-sized cities like Auckland were ripping out their trams and replacing them with trolley buses. This was the modern trend, so there was no reason why Auckland wouldn't follow suit. Secondly, trolley buses were cheaper than trams. They were cheaper to purchase. And also, if the board wanted to, in, in the future, extend a, a route, uh, they could do so cheaply with a trolley bus system. With a tram system, you had to install costly tracks. And then thirdly, trolley buses were suitable for Auckland's needs. They could, as I mentioned earlier, climb hills a lot better than trams could, which was helpful because Auckland's quite hilly. Uh, also, trolley buses could pull to the curb, meaning they could pick up passengers better than trams could. And finally, they were actually smaller. And this was not billed as a negative. This was a positive in the mind of the Auckland Transport Board because Auckland, in their mind, would not expand as, exp as exponentially as it did. And so the smaller capacity was just right for Auckland. Yet all of this happened amidst another debate that was raging throughout the 40s and the 50s, whether Auckland should construct a railway scheme or motorways. All of this began in the late 1940s. During that period, Auckland was becoming increasingly congested. People were buying more cars, driving those cars around more. Uh, the population of Auckland was rising pretty considerably. And all of this was happening when the inner city streets of Auckland really hadn't changed since 1900. So something had to change. The government's first port of call was to consider completely changing and revitalizing Auckland's existing railways to get people out of their cars and onto the trains. And so what they did was they approached two English engineers who were experts on passenger transport, William Halcrow and J.P. Thomas, leading to the Halcrow and Thomas reports. And they advised that three main projects should be constructed amongst, amongst others. The first of those was the Morningside deviation, as you can see on this map, go running right underground from the old Auckland main station at Beach Road up to Shorten Street, then stopping again at the Town Hall, and then going all the way down to Arch Hill and Morningside. So people would have better uh, access to the city by trains, just like the city rail link uh, now, about 70 to 80 years later. The next proposal was that the entire railway system in Auckland suburbia should be electrified because electric trains were faster, they were quieter, and they smelt better than the, than the alternative, so people would use them. And the third proposal was that suburban stations should have car parks built next to them. So Aucklanders could travel like New Yorkers and Londoners did. They could drive to the nearby uh, suburban railway station, park their car, hop in the tube, and then go straight to their city workplaces. All of this was designed to get congestion down. Yet despite the fact that the government originally endorsed this project, they then got cold feet and eventually went ahead with a master transportation plan, which was made by the Auckland Regional Planning Authority. This planning authority was absolutely dominated by anti-rail activists who wanted motorways to be constructed instead. And so that's exactly what they argued for. They said that the rail scheme would fail because Auckland had such a low population density that only a small number of people would actually live in and around each train station, meaning that not many people would take the trains and so it would be a wasted investment. They then said that Aucklanders just like cars and so they wouldn't use trains even if they were convenient and cheap. And finally, they argued that motorways could deal with congestion. They could, so to speak, kill two birds with one stone. The first bird 
being that they could just transfer a lot of cars because they were bigger and cars could hit higher speeds on motorways. The second bird being that buses could actually run along the motorways uh, and therefore public transport could be served by the motorways too. Of course, that only happened in 2008 when the Northern Busway was constructed. But the big question upon the switch from trams to trolley buses and the switch from the rail scheme to motorway construction is did either of those decisions actually influence Auckland's congestion problems? Now, this is obviously a big question. I can't go into all of my analysis in these couple of minutes, but I'll give you the snippets of my conclusions. With respect to the shift from trams to trolley buses, I found that really it didn't have much of an influence. Aucklanders liked their cars more than trams and more than trolley buses because they were more flexible, becoming increasingly cheaper over the 50s, and Aucklanders were getting wealthier. So it really wouldn't have mattered what the Auckland Transport Board offered. Trams or trolley buses, people would have bought motor buses, uh, more motor cars rather, and driven them around more, creating more congestion. So a negligible impact at best. Yet the shift from a rail scheme to motorway construction, in my mind, was a more convincing cause uh, of Auckland's later day congestion. And I can split this into two parts. Firstly, motorways, at least in the long term, actually caused congestion because when funding only motorways and nothing else, Aucklanders had no alternative really except to drive. And so they bought more cars and drove those cars around more, creating more congestion. The same applied with surface streets, which, which linked to the high capacity motorways. Now these surface streets could only be widened so much. So really, when a lot of cars would then turn off these off-ramps into the smaller surface streets, they, the, the surface streets would just get congested. And then finally, the provision of central city car parks, which was part of this entire plan, just encouraged people to drive into the city and park there, creating even more congestion. On the flip side, there's an argument that the rail scheme could have alleviated some congestion. This entire idea that Aucklanders would only drive cars seems a little flawed, especially given that in 1955, uh, as noted in the Master Transportation Plan, about half of all tra passenger trips in Auckland were taken by public transport. So Aucklanders were still using public transport in the mid-50s, and it's important to keep in mind that this public transport wasn't very good. The trams were getting old and were about to be replaced, the trolley buses were always stuck in traffic, and the, rails, the railways, because they hadn't been updated, had no direct city access, and yet people still used them. And so, if a convenient an attractive railway system had been provided, there's a chance that Aucklanders would have used it. That chance increases if suburban car parks had been provided because then Aucklanders could have just driven to the nearby train station and then used the train to get into the city. And then finally, the max capacity of the Halcrom and Thomas rail scheme proposal was 200 million passengers per annum. And so really, if it had been successful, the rail scheme could have been a long-term solution to Auckland's problems because it wouldn't have maxed out capacity-wise as quickly as the motorways did. So overall, to me, it seemed as though the switch from trams to trolley buses, if any, had a very small uh, effect on Auckland's developing congestion. But the switch from the rail scheme to constructing motorways instead drove congestion like nothing else. And to me, it seems as though over the 50s and the 60s, Auckland became so, so occupied with trying to transport cars that it forgot the important part to transport people. And people are not necessarily synonymous with cars. If you can attract people out of their cars what, using uh, a convenient public transport system, then that could have done the trick. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation and thank you to the Auckland Heritage Trust as well.